Dana Childs. She's amazing. <laughs> and I'm just going to let you do your thing. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, I'll just go with it. Um, oh. Oh. I just want everybody to take a deep breath. Just settle into where we are. I'm going to do my best to do this seated and still because a lot of energy tends to pull through and I like to move around, so I'll try not to fidget um, too much. But I want us just to drop into where we are and drop into your body. We tend to hang around in our mind. Mm -hmm. We tend to hang around outside of our body. So I just invite you to come all the way down into your body, through your pelvis, all the way through your legs, into your feet, connecting to that space underneath you all the way down to the ground that takes you into your ancestry and into your DNA. And take another deep breath in, and as you exhale, you want to exhale the past. And take another deep inhale, inhaling the present moment, exhaling the worries. Now, you can open your eyes and you can feel that we've just reoriented and mm -hmm. resettled and recentered. So I'm going to, it's funny because I took notes as you were talking, there was so much stuff coming through and I kind of jotted down notes and I don't know why because I never look at them, but I just, for some reason, maybe they're imprinted somewhere in here and they'll come out. I will talk, but I also want to open this up. So if I'm saying something and you have questions that are coming through, ask them. Let's make this a dialogue. And this doesn't have to be the Dana show because that can get boring. Um, <laughs> so we'll make it a dialogue. And and if I say something and it, and it brings up this big question or this like, do not hesitate to interrupt me. It, I can just keep right on going. If you ask me to repeat something, I'll be a little hard pressed <laughs> because the energy comes in so fast and when I'm channeling in this way, it's like a goldfish. So you may have three second memories. And so you swim around, you're like, oh, a castle. Oh, a castle. <laughs> it's kind of like that up here. <laughs> um, so if you ask me to repeat something, I'll do my best, but it may be totally different or I may just go, oh, a castle. <laughs> um, all right, so I just am trying to feel out kind of where everyone is because I, I don't know why I had the sense that everyone would be here for the same reason, and it's really evident everyone's here for a really different reason. So I want to hold that, and I want to hold the intention that the healing energies that you need, specifically you need, for those of you here in person, and for those of you on live stream, that those energies are coming through, and they are reaching you, and they are going into your body and into your field in whatever ways, and if you will just give yourself permission, you can do it in this moment out loud, or you can do it in your, in your mind, to release any energies that no longer serve you, to release and, and find any blockages, I do use that word, any blockages that are in your way, we want to highlight those and bring those out and bring those up so that there is change occurring. As I'm talking, I invite you to go into yourself to make what I'm saying about you, because this is your experience, and Allow yourself to feel whatever you start to feel because you may have emotions or sensations that come up while I'm talking that catch you by surprise or that you don't anticipate, and I just invite you to honor that and honor those. Um, so this will be an individual energy healing for everyone here, everyone participating. That's the intention I'm holding. So in that, I want to honor the spirit that each of us individually is. We want to affirm our spirits, just us, just our own personal energy. And I want to affirm all the spirits around us, those that are seen and those that are unseen. And I want to affirm the greater spirit, the divine spirit. That's what we ask all things flow through. Nothing else gets in. Yeah. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. I need to go to the flyer. You guys know that? It's so cool. So as I was, um, you know, kind of trying to figure out, as I try to do, right, in my mind, what to talk about, and I kept getting nothing. I'm like, well, I know I'm not talking about nothing. Right. And I just kept getting nothing. And I was like, okay, so this is the thing where I show up, and it, and it is what it is, and there's some greater presence at play. And the theme that I, I there's lots of different things, and I've kind of written them all down, but... 
But there are a few points I want to make, and a big, big theme I'm feeling in here today is the feminine and the masculine. Mm -hmm. And it's been really interesting to me that as we're talking about our feminine bodies and our feminine selves and feminine energy, we have been approaching it in a masculine way, mm -hmm. right? Can I fix? What's the problem? What's the solution? Mm -hmm. Who can I see? Who can help me? What do I do? And, and it has just been so jolting to actually see it and feel it and to feel how we step into the masculine energy of pushing, mm -hmm. right? Pushing the energy, pushing what needs to happen, pushing the information. And so I invite us to enter into a feminine space, which is about receptivity. Mm -hmm. So instead of pushing and finding and searching, it's allowing and receiving. Mm -hmm. And that softer, gentler way of something coming into you. There is, um, I love the example of the Grand Canyon. So masculine energy tends to feel very earthy and it's, mm -hmm. it's earth-based and it's solid. And feminine energy is, is very flowy and I think of it like water. And so I think of it like a stream or a creek. And, and then we tend to go, oh, but that's a little weaker. That's not quite as powerful. And then we look at the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. Water carved that canyon. Feminine energy is persistent, mm -hmm. right? It will trickle around any block that shows up in the way. Mm -hmm. It will navigate through that. That's the power of femininity is it doesn't stop. It's always ever present, finding the ways around. Mm -hmm. So I invite us again into that space and that power of receptivity and that softening and and when we go into healing in a feminine way rather than a masculine way, we go into it by receiving the information that we need, receiving the, the people that we need to receive in to help us, accepting help, right? I, it's um, funny how brilliant, what's the show, Sister Wives? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've always wondered, like, I can never share my man like that. I just don't know how that happens. But then I look at the amazing network and community that they have in support, these women supporting women, and how we receive help and we, and we honor the help from other women, like how drastically our lives start to change and shape. And so thank you for creating a sisterhood where that's possible, right? Where the, because in the energetic center of that second chakra, which is where some deep femininity sits and the, and the energies of emotions. Are you guys familiar with chakras? Mm -hmm. Just energy centers, right? In different parts of the body. And we can break it down to the Hindu seven, but I work on a 12 system and it doesn't really matter because there's probably actually hundreds. Yeah. So, yeah. So, <laughs> just to be honest, it doesn't really matter. Um, there's, they're all working together, but if we kind of bucket this, this deep sort of sense of feminine energy in the second chakra and, and this, the reproductive organs, which is interesting that the, the second chakra houses that, but it also houses the center of competition. And so when we compete, it's where we use our weapons. So when we compete with other women and we use our weapons against other women or other people or in general, that's impacting everything in that center. It's impacting everything in our world, but it's impacting that center. So just to be mindful of that, that space. And in this, it's interesting because you were talking about, I don't even think you were talking about it, maybe I was hearing as you were talking, but body functionality. Right, and getting connected to the body. And there are all the studies that talk about children when they're growing up, young girls, adolescent girls, and that's about when people are going to, children will develop um, adolescent. It's in our adolescence that we will start developing eating disorders or not, mm, usually. Yeah. And they talk about how adolescent girls who have a deeper relationship with their body and more appreciation, a healthier relationship, they are aware of their body functionality, mm -hmm. how it functions. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like athletic. You know, girls who are athletic tend to have healthier relationships with their bodies because it's how it functions. Mm -hmm. Can I kick the ball? Can I, you know, dribble the ball? Can I move? Does my body move like this? Can I do flips? Can I, am I, am I flexible? Is it functioning for me? Versus the non-functionality, right? When we're focused on how it looks, or how we're received or appreciated by our bodies, then we go into more of a self, 
like a self-judgment place, self-awareness place, and we try to exert control. Because eating disorders are about control, and at the root of it, I think eating disorder, this is my own personal hypothesis from all the clientele that I've worked with, I think eating disorders are about disconnect from our natural self. Mm -hmm. And psychologists and counselors will tell you that one of the hardest things to heal, help someone heal, is an eating disorder. And I'm like, well, yeah, because it's the disconnect, the disowning of yourself, mm -hmm. right? And so to come back into purpose and back into self is the way that you start to mend that relationship with the body, you know, how it functions and how it carries you. Now, the idea of masculinity and femininity, we're also, I wanna really look at that because we should carry ourselves, as women these days in this modern society, we have to foray into the masculine because we have to get things done. Mm -hmm. I used to have a partner who, he was a single dad, and he would always say, well, I'm just, I just don't mother well, I just, I'm not a nurturer, I'm so tired of being a nurturer, and that mothering energy is so hard and so draining on me. And finally, a psychologist looked at him and said, actually, mothering is extremely masculine. And he was like, what? <laughs> he was like, mothering is extremely masculine. You know, think about that. It's get your shoes on, get your, you know, teeth brushed, get your, get shit done. That's, it's this idea of mothering becomes really, really masculine. And in that we tend to bucket things out. And as women functioning in today's world, we do need masculine energy to not get run over. And especially those of us who work or in the working world, which is most of us these days, we have to have that in order to get something done, in order to show up, in order to push our life forward. And so we're holding that, and then sometimes we're dropping away our feminine energy or we're having a hard time going from our work world back into our life or our partnership because mm -hmm. we're still trying to push things through. <laughs> we're still operating, and we need that time and that space and figuring out what that is for you to reorient back into the feminine. Be it that on your drive home, you're listening to a podcast, or be it that you're listening to a certain music or you're lighting a candle or you get home and you take a bath or whatever your ritual is for you, but to make sure that you're reorienting back into that because in that feminine space is the space that we receive. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a big place where we start going missing. We don't, we don't receive the energy. I mean, even in sexuality, mm -hmm. we're a receptive cult, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> oh, we are receiving <laughs> all the time in sex. That's what we do. And so we're receiving, now we're giving to and we're nurturing with our, our kidney chi and our kidney energy, but we're, we're nurturing and we're giving, but we're also receiving. And when we can orient into that, then everything can, can start to really shift around. The other thing I want to honor that's sitting in this room today is longing mm -hmm. and desperation mm -hmm. and the power of that. Because so many times we make ourselves wrong for longing and we make ourselves wrong for feeling desperate. Mm -hmm. And I remember, gosh, this has probably been 10 years ago, if not longer, maybe 12 and I had um, a boss at the time who had introduced me to meditation when I was working in the bank. It was a very odd boss. Um, <laughs> I'm so grateful and thankful, but I'm like, it was really wackadoo. Um, but he had introduced me to meditation and we had gone out to, I think it was like somewhere beautiful, Washington State. Yeah, I'm like trying to remember. <laughs> it was Washington State. And because it was just space and land and, and beauty and it was this idea of meditating and just sitting. And they're like, whatever is comfortable for you. You can sit, you can stand, you can lay, you can do whatever. It doesn't matter. Just kind of let things roll through. And so there was this place where there were 20 or 30 people. And some of them had been meditating for months, mm -hmm. every day. So you weren't allowed to touch knives. Like you couldn't, like their bodies were having a hard time functioning because they were so meditated. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to really connect to their, their divinity or right? whatever that was for them. And there was a woman who just started crying and, and she was just, you could just feel in her the longing. She was like, I don't know where God is, right? I don't, that was her word for it. That's my word, some source or Buddha or Allah or whatever you want to say, but that was her word. And the person in charge who was leading this, um, she said, well, but you're getting into desperation. And then she stopped herself and she said, you know what? Be desperate. Mm -hmm. Embrace the energy of desperation and embrace whatever it is that you need to embrace. And feel that longing and feel that pull because that's something that you need to honor in yourself. Mm -hmm. And it was this permission to long for something. Mm -hmm. 
be it something that you didn't have, or be it something that you didn't know but you knew existed, or be it, but the idea of longing for something means you know that it exists. Mm -hmm. And think about the power of that. We can't long for something that we have no idea is out there. We can't long for true partnership. We can't long for true love. We can't long for true nurturing. We can't long for an ice cream cone. If we don't, <laughs> sorry. If, we, if we don't know that it's there, right? So the power of that, our longing is information. It doesn't mean we're broken. It means our spirit is pointing us in a direction. Be it that we're supposed to get whatever we long for, or be it that really we're supposed to do the journey of the longing. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, I think about it, you know, for myself with relationship. And I just, I love the idea of falling in love. And I love being in love. And I love partnering. And I love, I just love that. So, of course, my journey has been such of the longing for it and the, and the learning about it. And the working toward it. And I'm like, oh, but that's not going to happen yet. And then the longing for it again. And then the, oh, but that's not the person anymore or the you know what I mean it's like that and there's a real um it's like sense of freedom that can come from leaning into that feminine receptive place of oh that's what the path looks like and the joy of the longing that tells me this thing exists that leads me down this path where I find all this other amazing cool stuff mm -hmm. and if I focus only on the outcome I'm missing all this magic in the middle does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So if we're sitting here and we go, oh, I, I want to go to California. Well, we don't go, okay, then let me, boop, I'm there. Oh, Jeannie, no, that would be amazing. Boop, I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> One day, I think we'll travel like that, um, but in our human form, not today. So, so then we, we make plans because we long to go to California. Maybe we do research and maybe we call some friends out there and maybe we then research plane tickets or maybe we go, oh, I want to drive. But all of that, we don't just flip from the longing into the exact moment of being. There's all this other joy that takes place in the moment of that longing, be it that we ever get there or we don't. Because how many of you, I know, have planned trips and I'm like, oh, this is going to be amazing. And I don't actually go, but I just love the planning of it. It's so exciting. And then by the time it gets time to like actually book it, I'm like, oh, I don't even need the energy of that anymore. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times in my head I've planned Egypt. Oh. A lot. And then I'm like, it gets time, and I'm like, it's not the place I need to go. I've pulled in the energy in some other way. There's something else I was meant to, to find or bump into. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I just invite you to be on that experience as well. Now, I want to shift into, I'm feeling guided to shift into talking about the wisdom in our bodies. Mm -hmm. I think that... I think that having a body is fucking hard. Mm -hmm. I I keep talking, <laughs> right? I keep talking to God, and I say God. And I've I always heard them. Why do we have these human bodies? I know, right? Okay. Okay. But, that's my question. <laughs> like, what the fuck, God? There's got to be an easier way. Human bodies are made of mud. No. Okay, I do acupuncture regularly, and my acupuncturist laughs at me, and he's like, "Oh, we should do some esoteric acupuncture." And I was like, okay, what's that? And he goes, actually, never mind, you don't need it. And I was like, but wait, it sounds like fun. And he goes, well, no, he's like, you're kind of an oddball. And I was like, well, okay, I've heard that all my life. <laughs> but what do you mean by it? And he said, well, most people, it's like opening their spirit to get them connected to their spirit. And he said, with you, it's getting your body out of the way and you're there. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty cool. And my body is in my way <laughs> so often, right? And he's like, that's where you block yourself. So as soon as you have a body symptom, you're like in your way. It's a block between mm -hmm. you and spirit. It's like, well, that's a different way to think about it. But these bodies, I think we have, and I think they are dense. And they are, they, they, they're physical energy. So they're denser than our spirit. And they're denser than our soul. And I do see those as two different things. Mm -hmm. I see our spirit as this piece of us that's really connected to, to the divine or an element of the divine all the time. And I see our soul as what comes in with us, you know, lifetime after lifetime, if you will, if you believe in that sort of thing, or through your genetics, if you would rather believe that way, whatever's comfortable. But that idea of it holds the lessons so it can learn the truths of spirit, spiritual truths, but it can also learn non-truths. Mm -hmm. Make sense? If we're growing up and our and our mom and dad teach us like this is water, <laughs> we'd be like water, water, 
Well, we'll get to elementary school and they'll be like, you go, I want water. And they're like, here. And you're like, that's not water. I don't want, right? We can learn truths and untruths spiritually. That's why we can feel like we're unworthy or unlovable because that's a spiritual untruth. And yet our soul may have experienced that in this lifetime through an event, right? <laughs> on numerous events or through other lifetimes. It's why things like ageism and sexism and racism can exist because people's souls are convinced that that's a truth, mm -hmm. right? Spirit and soul I see is very different. And so our goal is to align our soul with our spirit, to get all the truths all the time. When we come in in human form, we can't do that because if we were, say, abused by someone, we would be like, oh, but it's okay because I, I get that it's all for the best. Mm. It's fucking not. Don't hit me. Right? Right. right. So it's, we have to kind of have that soul that has those boundaries so we can have that, that denser space. And then we get to this other space. So our spirit will always tell us the truth. Our soul can lie to us. Right? Our mind can lie to us. and often does. Since it's on, on like a little, you know, wild goose chases. Our body is always a truth teller which I think is hard to hear, mm -hmm. especially when your body's not cooperating with what you want mm -hmm. or what you want it to do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's a fucking pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, recognizing this body as a truth teller, we recognize like it can't lie and that's a really hard thing to hear. Mm -hmm. Then we have to, you know, we're, we're being, we don't have to, but we're being guided to come into this really gentle place with our body and understand it as what are you trying to show me rather than how are you trying to punish me? Mm -hmm. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. So so coming into this, what's the message? The body is a messenger. It's do you guys drive cars? Mm -hmm. So I, I listen, in a New York summit, that question does not go up. Oh my gosh, it's so true. <laughs> so I'm like, oh your car, and you're like, and I'm like, oh, right, okay, in the subway. Wrong place, yeah. So, <laughs> in your car, you know, you have, like, lights that come up, and they'll tell you, like, oh, your tire needs air, or it's time for an oil change, or whatever else makes me panic every time I see a light on my dashboard. I'm like, <laughs> what's wrong? <laughs> so, your, your body's the same way. Light comes on. Maybe you have a headache. Maybe you have your, your cheese block, right? Something's <laughs> telling you something. It's giving you something. You're, you have a pain in your hand. Your face itches. You have a rash. You have um, polycystic ovary syndrome. Is that how you say PCOS? I just learned that that acronym was today. Thank you. Um, you, you know, whatever. Hashimoto's. You have these things. Your body is communicating something to you. And, and it is sort of we are responsible for these vessels because they just like we're responsible for our cars. We want to get the oil changed and we want to make sure we have the tire. And we, want to, we do all this because it also takes care of us. You know, I view my car as like a living thing. Mm -hmm. And it might be. You know what? <laughs> sometimes animate things can be inanimate in there and, and sometimes mm -hmm. not. But, but I really am like, what are you trying to tell me? Like, there's something off. There's something I need to know. And when we view our body like that, it becomes something that is our divine responsibility to and for because it's helping us navigate our life. Mm -hmm. and, and I am of the mindset, and I'll just throw this out as a belief that you can go with or you don't have to, but I'm of the mindset that our, our choice, right, before we incarnate into this difficult human body, which we'll get back to the difficulty of it in a moment, but before we incarnate into it, we really are looking at our entire purpose, our reason for being, and we go, what, what body do I need? What shape should it be? What color should my hair be? What should my eyes be? I think we're really divinely piecing all that together with help from the divine or help from our council of elders and wise ones on the other side or wherever you want to think of it. And so that we come into form and we have the exact DNA we need, we have the exact parents we need, we have the exact body, the exact hair, the everything we need to do our purpose. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to us to reconnect with that purpose and to, to be responsible to our body for whatever 
it, it needs us to understand. So, so when we look at our symptoms as things that oh, <laughs> as things that really are communicating with us rather than how are you fucking punishing me today? Right. Or, or betraying me and betraying what I want, mm -hmm. then it becomes this role place of, of wisdom that can set in. So when we're looking at something like, and I'm talking on the energetic spiritual level is how I'm looking at the body. So if we're looking at something like a thyroid or Hashimoto's, yes, there are chemicals that go into that, but there are also energetic components that go into that. How have you used or most likely not used your voice throughout your life? How have you been told that what you have to say isn't important? And how is your body now telling you? Fucking use your throat. Use it. I'm a singer. <laughs> Wild, right? Yeah, right? There's a lot, like you're pulsating through there, like it's bright colors. I'm like, I'm watching shit that needs to get out there. So, so it's like coming through that. And then the other thing that kind of comes through is, you know, there is there are all these psychic, if you will, intuitive capabilities that we all have, and they're all very different. And we, we can develop them or not, it doesn't matter, but we all have them. It's, it's our divine right to have some kind of special dharmic gift that nobody else has. It's an energy that nobody else has. And so we have that, and if we're not waking it up, our body is gonna do our best, do its best, it's always serving us. It doesn't know anything else. It's like, I'm gonna take care of you in this way. I'm gonna take care of you in this way. I'm gonna take care of you in this way. When I went to India on this big trek after I gave up my life, and I was like, I don't know, fuck my life, I need something different. Sold everything, oh my packed a backpack, bought a one-way ticket, and was like, I will go here. And <laughs> that's literally so what cool. I did. It was like, that or kill myself, and I'm like, yeah, I'll just run away. Yeah. It works. <laughs> it worked for me. I loved yoga at the time, it was good. Yeah, it was working. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so I went from not being able to keep weight on my body, living in the States, went to India, gained 30 pounds, and couldn't figure out what the fuck was wrong with me, and stopped having a period, didn't have a period for six months. All these wild things that started happening, and I felt like my body was betraying me. Mm -hmm. And when I look back on it, I mean, a pa parasites were at place, you know, we get those, especially in India, but, but, but it's like those things where our body's like telling us, and my body was like, hey, you don't have any boundaries. You don't have any energetic boundaries. We're gonna put some weight on you because weight is a boundary. Mm -hmm. So let's just add some stuff here and add some stuff here, and add some stuff here to keep some of that toxic energy out that you don't yet know how to keep out. Mm -hmm. So, so, so if we're like not the weight we want to be, we tend to go like, ah, I can't die on that. It's not that. There, there is an energetic, emotional component. So true. What are we trying to keep out, mm -hmm. right? And our body's like, I got you. I'm gonna give you a big inner tube around your middle. No, I'm gonna do it that way. And we're like, fuck you, body. And the body's like, you can thank me later. <laughs> I went to India, I had this friend, and she was actually very psychic, and she goes, oh, I just see your body getting ready, and I was like, what do you mean? She goes, I just see it's like this little inner tube, and these little flippers, oh, and, you get, and so I get there, and within two weeks, I'm like, I gained fucking 30 pounds, and I was like, speak of inner tube, it's like a fat tube around here, <laughs> right? but, but it's this kind of cool way the body's always trying to serve, so if we're talking about something like PCOS, right, and these, the, the, the cysts that pop up. A, we're looking at what's the message. We want to look at where that message is. So, so these psychic gifts, right? They come through our throat. This is about the ability to shake and change and shift energy in the world with what comes through your voice. Be it what you have to say or be it the tonality that comes through because every single note that you sing is a healing gift in itself. Mm. There is a gift of healing called toning. And people will tone, and you can feel it through your bodies. Yeah. Singing bowls, you guys know what singing bowls are? Mm -hmm. So in Tibet, they have Tibetan <coughs> massage through singing bowls, and they place the singing bowls over this energetic components of your chakras, whatever, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they ring them, and it heals throughout your body, it reverberates. We are primordially sound. That's where we originated. Sound, right? So it's there's a gift there 
it's time for you to, to look at. That's what your body's saying. I would mm -hmm. not be surprised if you weren't a medium. Sorry, I just have to throw that in there. Oh, I, I pick up a lot of stuff. Yeah. So when there are spirits hanging around yeah. that want to <laughs> communicate, nice and we're, we're listening, <laughs> or we're not listening, or we're giving the messages, or we're not giving the messages, or we're not making time for it, or we're not having the appropriate boundaries around our gift, yeah. it will throw your thyroid out like that. Wow. It's interesting. I need to share this. Um, was it, uh, and the timing was weird, but timing is never a coincidence. About a week after we got, we did, we, we've been together, Larry and I have been together for almost five years in July. And so we finally decided, okay, let's do the thing. You want to do the thing? Let's do the thing. Okay, we're going to do the thing. Mm -hmm. And then within two weeks, I started itching here. And you said itching your face. I'm like, oh, she is not. I started itching here. Funny. So I never saw that. And in the last few weeks, it has transformed into here and into my chest. Do I have a rash? Mm -hmm. No. And at night, it keeps me up at night. It's like, what? And I've even thought to myself, what energetically is like bottled up in here mm. wow. that's not coming out? Right. So it it's just like, insane. what's on the surface? What's an irritant? Right. And I'm, I'm emotional and I'm talking. Yeah. The good stuff. Right. But, <laughs> but <it's laughs> okay. yeah. what, what is the irritant? What is it? Ugh that I just can't quite get. Like, what is my spirit trying to communicate with me? This is communication. And if there's no coincidence that it's here and here, this right. is your fifth chakra, honey. Right. This is like Fresh all, chakra. yeah, it's all what needs to move and what's your spirit drawing your attention to? That my whole body. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so I would say, find some books about mediumship. I don't know of any good ones, I'm sorry. But <laughs> they're all crap. I'm like, I'm I don't want to buy any books. <laughs> yeah, so, so then what you want is like a book around energetic boundaries mm -hmm. because mediums often have body problems because they're, it's dead energy that's going through your body. They die mm -hmm. young. There's all these sort of components of being medium. Figure out how to bring that gift in so that it's not wreaking havoc on your body. Because oh. I can see that gift of mediumship as soon as you mention Hashimoto's, which is why I was like, What's going on? I stared at you and I'm sorry. And I was like, I'm looking at her energetically. And I was like, oh, there's so many psychic gifts here that want to come so through here. It's a powerful center in you. Mm. And we have, like, in our in our body centers, right, we have, we don't want our chakras to all be, like, the same. They're, they're not. We're individual. We don't want a football player with a big throat chakra and a little teeny root chakra. We <laughs> <laughs> will not make it. We want a massive root chakra. We don't care about his throat chakra. Let's just quarterback in his calling place. Does that make sense? So, so whatever our purpose is, our energetic body will correspond, and it's up to us to take care of that. So if we're looking at this sort of idea of cysts and where they show up, and we're looking at, we're just going to go for the second chakra, right? So we're looking at that place. We're looking at what is my relationship to the feminine? Mm -hmm. What did I learn about it? And I'm going to track it right back to your mothers. <laughs> what did my mother teach me about this? What did they not? Where did they take care of me? Where did they not? What, what all sits in there? How did they orient to being a woman? Mm -hmm. And what, how did they orient to the feminine? And was their energy, as my mother, safe mm -hmm. or not safe? Make sense? Totally. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Just based on. Yeah, well, as kids, we want safety. Mm -hmm. And as kids, we don't know to lean into the divine. Mm -hmm. We learn that through painful experience, which is, which is sort of God's way of saying, Lean into me. I am here for you. And it's our human, you know, acceptance to go, oh, I'll have painful experiences because that gets me back closer to oneness. Mm -hmm. Right? And so we, we accept all that in there. And then as kids, we are looking at our parents and we are, instead of overlaying what we know the divine to be or God to be. When you say kids, do you mean like under the age of 10 or do you mean as Oh, I mean adolescents? like infants, toddlers, right. under the age of 10, 13, mm -hmm. you know, up until we're aware enough to go, oh, my parents are fucked up, yeah. which for some of us is 20 <laughs> and for some of us is 30 and for some of us is never, uh -huh. <laughs> right? As soon as the client comes to me and I'm like, okay, give me a couple sentences about your parents and they go, oh my God, you know, I had a great childhood and they're really great. And I'm like, that is the biggest red flag. 
So I'm like, I'm going to take my time, but I know what that's what I always I'm say. I want to know what she sees so bad. <laughs> so, so in this, as kids, we don't know to lean into the divine, and we don't have anywhere else to get that model except for our parents. So we start creating our model of the divine. Again, I like the word God. It's comfortable for me. I don't, I don't mean for it to set anybody off, right? It's whatever your word is. But we create our image of what God is for how our parents show up. Mm -hmm. So then is God, is he, she, it conditional, punishing, rewarding? Mm -hmm. Maybe not always there. Ignores me. Ignores me. Doesn't show up. Right. That's then what we think of God. So how your parents showed up for you right. is most likely your relationship with God. And that is your responsibility to heal. That's yeah, so my life. Isn't it? Yeah. This is the shit I love. <laughs> I just love it. I, I can talk about energy and all that stuff all day, but like you get to God and I'm like, oh, this is like big block for a lot of people. Yeah. Right? Right? So, so then we go to, if my parents didn't show up for me, God's not going to show up for me. I'm not safe in this situation, whatever it is. If I'm punished for doing wrong by my parent, then, oh my God, I used to, I remember when I was um, young and I would do something wrong and I'd be like, I'm going to be punished because I wasn't, I wasn't 100% a good girl. I'm going, something's going to happen. And then it would, because right fear creates faster than, <laughs> faster than anything else. And it's, it's that space of like, we don't trust that pure energy because we're looking at it through the eyes of our, how our parents show up. Mm -hmm. And then our, our relationships, specifically romantic relationships, all geared toward healing those wounds. Because as someone with an energy, right, we all have it, <laughs> we all have energy, we are designed to heal all the time. Mm -hmm. We are 100% whole. And we are designed to remember that. Mm -hmm. And so every experience that we have that's a wound that starts getting created, we then look for, okay, how do I heal it? And if we're three, right, and our parents are having a fight, and we can't toddle up to our parents and go, I'm going to my room and closing my door, and you guys need to have a divorce. Yeah. <laughs> we don't typically do that. So, so then what we end up doing is shutting all that down, yeah. Assuming unsafety, assuming we're not cared for, locking that away, don't even remember it, happens again at five, seven, ten, whatever, right? And then when we're 27, I don't know why I made up that number, um, when we're 27, what happens is we're like, in a real, is it? Oh my God. <laughs> we're like, I'm not I'm like, so what happens is we're, we're looking at, oh, hmm. Why am I not able to have boundaries? Because I just think this is the way it is, or I think I'm always stuck here, or I think it's because that three-year-old in you is going, ooh, let's push this as an experience because this is our chance to heal what happened at three, and six, and 10, and now let's draw this situation in closer because now we're old enough to get it and to heal it, and we're gonna Velcro all that old gunk to it and let it all go. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. So, so, or, so, <laughs> just lay down on the floor. Go ahead. I can feel it. I can feel it. So, and please check me on time because I have no clue. I I'm sure that I we'll be fine going that. right up to Carrie. Yeah. I'm sure everyone will be fine. So, so in this, um, sort of going toward, you know, our idea of our parents and the safety or not, I want to give, I want to give an example to drive home my point. I, was in a relationship and I had sort of raised the child from five to ten and it was his mother had abandoned him mm -hmm. at two and she's since come back in the picture and it's you know much better now but in this we had I had right um, fostered a couple of puppies over Christmas this is several years ago and because I really wanted a puppy and I was like mm -hmm. let's just ease everybody into it <laughs> and so I had, had these couple puppies and I was like fostering them and loving it and the child that I thought he was like seven at the time and I thought he would just be all over these puppies he could really have cared less and he's a dog person he could have cared less and I was like wow this is really interesting he's not bonding to the puppies and I just kind of watched it and then it was like New Year's Eve where I had to take the puppies to catch the truck to go up to their forever homes in New York 
And so I'm like having him say goodbye to the puppies and put him to bed. And a few minutes later, we hear wailing mm -hmm. throughout the house. And my partner at the time was like, oh my God, let me go and just like calm him down. And I was like, no, 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 don't do it. I was like, this is free. And he's like, he didn't even care about this fucking puppy. <laughs> 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 like, the dog's left. The dog, yeah, I was like, I know, but this isn't about the dogs. Right. So I was like, this is his grieving for his mother that he couldn't do when he was two. Yeah. This is the grieving for the loss that he's had that needs to just wash out of his body. Let him wail. Let him wail. Because, interesting side note, the energy of grief, we so have a, we don't deal with it, right? We just don't have a good way of dealing with it. We don't teach it, but we should. It's so palpable. We all have it. What we tend to do when we see someone in grief is to go, ah, are you okay? Mm -hmm. Touch stops grief. Mm -hmm. Don't touch somebody when they're grieving. Mm -hmm. Don't hug them. Don't make it okay. Mm -hmm. Let them grieve. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do, to watch someone in grief and to watch someone feel it and to have the emotional fortitude to be able to hold that space of watching someone grieve and tell them, I am here for you. I am right here. That's so amazing. Um, I know I'm sharing a lot, but this is just resonating with me so greatly. Um, <clears throat> my father passed about a year and a half ago. And Larry, he's such a strong person. He's the most gentle soul, but he's so strong in himself that when I would just like, literally start sobbing, like the bawling, like gagging on your own snot, I mean, you're, I mean the whole mess, I would just be over the couch and bent over, and he just lets me do it until I come to him for the hug. Yes. It's, it's, I, I never thought about that how beautiful that is. That is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Because that's the opposite of how we're programmed. We're right. programmed to make someone stop the emotion right, right. because deep emotion tends to make us uncomfortable yeah. because we don't want to feel it. We're empathic creatures. We want to we want to connect. We want to connect, and we're empathic, and we feel what someone else feels. And if they're uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable. So let me make you feel better. Right? <laughs> so when we have the strength to be able to allow someone to so feel what true. they feel and not go anywhere strongest message we can give they will come to us when they want to be touched mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. right so it's, if it, it's the same with verbal though too like people want to fix they want to validate oh, totally. they want to mm -hmm. and and people have asked me about what do you say to someone that's in the middle of a struggle and i tell them i'm so sorry this happened to you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's it right to, to just kind of be there with it i my family is extremely dysfunctional um, which I love, because I'm like, I see all the ways to not do everything. <laughs> in that, like, I think I've seen my mom cry twice in my life, and yes, most times same. she was drunk or something. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. So she just, like, doesn't have emotion. And I remember sitting at the table, this has been a few years ago, with my sister, one of my sisters, and one of my nieces. And, which, interesting, I'll talk about, remind me to talk about female and male when you have a lot of kids in, in a second. But we're sitting around and my mom starts guilt tripping, because that's always fun. Yeah. She's got a degree in it, like a master's in it. So she starts guilt tripping my sister for like how she's parenting and that we don't come home for Christmas and yada, yada, yada. And so I, I just look at my mom and I'm like, this is not about us. And she goes, what? And I was like, well, A, I don't want to be guilted anymore. It's hard enough. But B, this is about your wounds as a child mm -hmm. and what needs you didn't have met. And now you're trying to guilt us mm -hmm. for something in you that hurts. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't feel good. And my mom, she's never talked about her childhood because it was so painful. Mm -hmm. And she like tears up and starts crying. And my niece pushes away from the table and gets up and walks off. <laughs> and my sister looks at me and she goes, Great, you made mom you cry. cry. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I just looked at my you sister and I was like, I didn't Sorry. make mom cry. Mm -hmm. Mom needs to cry. Mm -hmm. Let mom cry. Mm -hmm. you're, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Right. So they don't feel that way. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm not taking on your shit, but I love you enough to sit here with you in it. Right. <laughs> right? So, so it's that where our parents, unbeknownst, they didn't know it, they didn't know what they were doing 
have wounded us in all these ways. Mm -hmm. And then we become fearful, typically, of one type of energy or another masculine or feminine. Mm -hmm. We tend to have a safe parent and an unsafe parent, typically. Oh, and so then we align with the energy of the safe parent and deny the energy of the unsafe parent. Mm -hmm. Makes sense? Mm -hmm. So like my dad is my safe space. My mom is my disaster. And I, yes, right? And so it was like, I'll be more like my dad. I'm gonna get shit done, I'm not gonna care, I'll have feelings, we're just gonna do it, right? And my mom's just pretty non-functional and depressed. It was, is, whatever. It depends on the day. <laughs> Undiagnosed is probably the best way to say it. So, so in that, it took me years to learn the feminine because for me, what I viewed as feminine, even though it wasn't feminine energy, it was an absence of, it was a shut down. There was non-nurturing, there was non, right? There was non-acceptance of caring. Yeah, what I viewed as unsafe because of her imbalance in the energy she showed up, and my mind went to program being alone, being feminine is unsafe. Mm -hmm. I will be masculine. I will be this. And there is a reclaiming of what real femininity is and looks like, and a balance with what the masculine looks like. Because in this day and age, we have to have a piece of the masculine to function, mm -hmm. but we should be like 70 30. In moments and meetings, we may need to be 50-50. And sometimes someone needs a pointer of an home, we may whip out 70% masculine and be like, I look here, right? But, but overall, we should have this balance that's more feminine based than masculine. And that means looking at our parents with these eyes of understanding and wisdom to see what their journey has been and the compassion that we can have for them we have to honor our feelings through it and bring our feelings all the way up because we get stagnant. Here's where we get stagnant. We have the experience, that's the physicality, right? The root chakra. We have the emotion about it in that second chakra around our reproductive organs. And then we go, oh, oh, this is a lot of emotion. I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how to feel this. So I'm just gonna lock it down. Mm -hmm. Put it to the side. Mm -hmm. And then we go, oh, right. Let me be spiritual, and I call it spiritual bypass. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> let me be spiritual, and let me go from my second center of the feeling to my sixth chakra of here's the reason why. Uh, uh, I don't fucking care the reason why until right? you have gone up through the third sense of self, until you've routed it through anger, mm -hmm. you've routed it through your boundaries, through you've routed it through your indignation of what shouldn't have fucking happened when you were five, mm -hmm. right? right? And then you're like, okay, now, <laughs> right? That anger's gonna balance the sadness, and sadness balances the anger, and we need both. Mm -hmm. And then if we're stuck in one, by the way, if you're stuck in anger, you're denying your sadness, and if you're stuck in sadness, you're denying your anger. So if you ever feel stuck in one of those, honor the opposite to move things forward. <laughs> now, we feel that here, and then we move it up to the heart, and we have that more acceptance, right? It's where the acceptance happens. This is just what was. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sorry that I'm, I was hurting, and I'm sorry that I was hurt, and I'm, right, all this awareness of what was. And then it moves into our fifth, which is our voice around it. And our voice may be a private journal entry, and our voice may be a conversation with a friend, and our voice may be 15 years of therapy. And our voice, our voice may be beginning to blog or journal or talk to other people or writing a book or whatever our voice is, we honor that there. And then we move it up into the understanding. Then we hit the spiritual sort of mecca place of, oh, now I get it. Yep. <laughs> Just so I get, now I get why all this happened. Now I understand, understand why all of this that I didn't understand in the moment had to happen. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we connect to this place of true purpose. Mm -hmm. That reconnection to really being able to hear that divine voice of where we're led and where we're guided because we have complete access to everything, mm -hmm. not just some things. Make sense? So, so looking back at what models your parents presented, what the model of femininity and masculinity and, and, and where they were in it, right? Because I look at my dad and I'm like, oh, he's masculine. He was really good balance masculine. 
he got fired from a lot of jobs because he was mouthy and, you know, angry and, and just awesome. I love him. But, but all these kind of imbalances in his own masculinity. And so well, that's not maybe a healthy version of masculinity all the time, right? We can be imbalanced feminine, imbalanced masculine, masculine, and that can go either way. So if we think of balanced masculine, we're thinking of energetically, emotionally, someone who is present, mm -hmm. someone who is action-oriented, someone who is decisive, mm -hmm. and there is a strength there. Make sense? When we think of imbalanced masculine, we think of violent, aggressive, angry, a temper, fury, right? Dominating. And there's also a, a man can be imbalanced masculine in that he is too in the feminine, mm -hmm. right? Now, imbalanced feminine, we think of healthy feminine, and we're thinking of nurturing, receptive, passive often, not like, in a, like I'm avoidant, but passive, right? That water is going to find another way around. It's okay, right? And then when we think of um, imbalanced femininity, histrionic, hysterical, over-emotional, right? All these imbalanced pieces. And whatever our parents modeled, we will have a safe and we will have an unsafe and we will gravitate toward what our safe was. And so our, our work on ourselves, our personal work, is to come back to what is my personal balance? If I work through my wounds and what my parents taught me, what is my personal balance? What is my body asking me to do? Because my body's not going to lie. And if I'm having cysts that pop up in a part of my body that is innately feminine, what are they trying to show me about the feminine and the understanding of what the women in the lineage of my family have been through, what they believe, and how those beliefs align with my divine being or not? Wow. Right? What if you don't remember who the safe one was and who the unsafe one was? You don't have to remember. You can go back and think, like, just how they showed up, mm -hmm. you know? Because in moments, one parent can be safe and another can be, there can be 10 years where this one was safe and then 10 years where this one was safe, and they can vacillate as well. What if you don't remember so much? Huh. Which also was a big insight. Right. If we don't remember don't often, remember much. there's a lot of trauma emotionally around it because you're a very open being. Right. So when we come into this world, we come in really open. Mm -hmm. So whatever chakra that we talked about earlier, right, whatever centers are really magical in us, right, really big and open, they're going to be really big and open when we're born. When we're born, we're not verbal. Mm -hmm. We are 100% sensate. Mm -hmm. There's no other way we can take information, right? 100% sensate. So when we're born, everything that happens, we are feeling. Mm -hmm. That's all we got. Feeling. We're feeling our body. We're hungry. We pooped. We don't like the way that feels in our diaper. You know, whatever. And we're and we're we're feeling that. And then by the time we really have language, we don't yet have logic. Mm -hmm. And so in that feeling, whatever chakras that are really open, where our gifts lie, are getting bombarded, and we don't have any other way but to start constricting them. Mm, yeah, sounds all right. And so our innate gifts that we're born with, <laughs> our innate gifts that we're born with can often be paralyzed yeah. or closed down because they're traumatized. Mm -hmm. And and what I feel, what I see and witness, nine times out of ten, actually I'll say like ninety eight percent of the time, is that when someone tells me they don't remember their childhood, there was a lot of emotional trauma, even if there wasn't like abuse or something that we think of as traumatic as right. an adult. Mm -hmm. A lot of emotional trauma that can happen. Totally. Like when the repressed stuff starts coming up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh shit, I didn't realize that happened. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you don't, right. Like you don't remember parts of it, and then it's like, oh hi, I'm here. Right. I just happened to have been yesterday. Yeah. And then you're just like fucked up over it. Right. And then, and that's, then you're stuck in that like. Yeah. Angry, just like you didn't mm, keep but you're safe. Not, yeah, but you're not stuck there. Yeah. You're being shown that. I'm ready now. Know you're that, ready to heal it, right? Yeah. But we can't remember something. We're not given yeah. a memory that will overwhelm us. Right. We're given a memory because the divine says, or our spirit says, now you can handle this. Now you have mm -hmm. the wisdom, the experience, and the tools and the team to help you figure this out. I'm like, what happened? I need to know. <laughs> 
So, so here's a, I don't know why I need to tell the story. I was working with a client and she didn't remember any of her childhood. Yeah, not a word of it. And due to the weird way I work, I was like, did you have a cat? And she said, yes. And I said, the cat wants to share. This cat that she had as a child started telling all these things because the cat, who was now deceased, held a lot of the memories so that the child, who was a healer, like a shamanic healer, wouldn't have to. <laughs> what the fuck is happening? Oh my god, this is awesome. so crazy. Oh, girl, for sure. Yeah, I did not have a cat, no. Yeah. But so it's like, when we're born as healers, we can be really traumatized by, by things that other people just don't even notice. Like your parents thought this was normal, or this is, mm -hmm. and, and just because the feeling isn't being expressed, doesn't mean the feeling isn't there. Mm -hmm. So as empathic beings, you're highly empathic, mm -hmm. as empathic beings, if we're in a relationship with, or in family with, someone who doesn't do emotion, literally my whole entire family besides You me. are doing all of it for them. Mm -hmm. So then it can be really confusing as to what is your memory and what's not your memory because you're having everybody's feelings. Mm -hmm. That's right. insane. Yeah. Being an empath is huge. I have an online course about it, by the way. It's it's all about just it goes back to your whole childhood and current, and it is it's a, it's a, it's a big deal. Yeah, right. But your bodies are telling you work this shit out. Your body's not telling you, I hate you. I'm not going to give you what you want. Yeah. Your body's like, I have done my best to take care of you through all this hard shit you've gone through, mm -hmm. and I have absorbed this stuff for you, now it's time for you to take some of that responsibility. It's like I'm going to puke. <laughs> it's your beans. Yeah. Your beans. Yeah. The, so what happens with the Wait, energy? Stomach stomach makes feel like yeah. Erica, no. Yeah, so what happens with the way I work, sorry guys, is it starts pushing up to the physical body, it starts pushing up to the emotional body, to the energetic body, like I work on all, I say I, I don't, the divine does it, right? All those layers, So because I too am feeling really nauseous, because there's such, yeah, there's such, I don't want to clean that up, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but there's such vast changes that happen on a cellular level. Yeah. This is how I work. This is the energy that I call in. It's like, get this shit done, and your body's like, what? <laughs> it's, so it's really common. So you're having a healing. Wow. Is what you're, and you're feeling it. I feel like, I just want to live, since you start talking, my entire head is so itchy, and my whole body feels like it's, I'm radiating. It's like radiating, like pins and needles through my entire body. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm just bringing that in. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. All right. Yeah. But but so I'll I'll tell you, and I don't even. I think we're probably getting to time. And we're out of time, and I want to have time for questions. But but is this sort of of space of honoring your body as your truth, and, and honoring your body as I'm trying to help you. I'm not trying to hurt you. Mm -hmm. And what I'm showing you is something that you are. You're strong enough that you're wise enough to surrender into you, to start to, to figure out what specialness you hold that I've had to keep sheltered for you. Mm -hmm. There's a gift in it. And if you've got PCOS, you're in your past and you're taking everybody's emotions and feelings into your body because those gifts sit in the lower chakras. Mm -hmm. Let's just Come do on. that now, actually. Yeah. Let's ask. Whatever emotions are in your body that were not meant to be yours and that are no longer in your highest good, let's ask that those be sent back to where they belong or where God would have them be sent back to. We don't want to overwhelm someone else's soul if they can't feel or someone else's body. We want to have God deliver those. We want to be clear to that through all time, space, and dimensions. And if there are unhealthy connections that are holding you emotionally to someone else through cords or binds, we want to ask the divine, light those up from the center and start to light those away and burn those away so that there can be space for you to reclaim your divinity and not have to wear someone else's issues, again, through all space, time, and dimension. And we ask that this healing be done through the divine, the one and only it.
just come back into the room and everything. Like, <laughs> Let it happen. Just doing all right. Wow. I think. Do I have time for some questions? Yeah, yeah like you, 10 do. Minutes, you do. You do. Yeah, we have ten minutes. A lot of questions. I'm a parent, and the whole like on stage same thing. Like, how do I? I'm like afraid of fucking my child now. Yeah, you're gonna fuck your child. <laughs> 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 you're gonna fuck it up. You're gonna fuck it up. I think we're doing a pretty good job, you know what I mean? Yeah. So like, it's hard for me to think that one of us could be like on save, you know, yeah. parent. So like, mm -hmm. that's what I'm struggling with a little bit. It's like, you know, what can I do to kind of yeah. make sure? So or how do I know it? Well, here's the list a minute is, remember how we talked about your choosing like, your hair color, your eye color, your, your DNA, or you chose your mom and dad. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean, right? <laughs> right? I'm I love you. Here, I'm like, well, oh fuck, is I smoking in heaven? But yeah. actually, <laughs> no, I was, I was, I was, she was really sure. drunk. <laughs> Taylor was drunk when she signed her contract. She's like, okay, this is not. Yeah, I'm just like, if I have a dog for every time I've said that my mother has a fucking devil in her in the last four weeks, she might. Four weeks, she I might. could have paid for this class for all of y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Abundant AF right yeah. there. <laughs> no, when we have a parent who brings through, because we talked earlier before I was talking about, about that idea of light and dark, mm -hmm. and, and we it's all from divine, yeah. uh -huh. but when we can see the influences and we have a parent who yeah, My dad was my safe one, and yeah. Right. It's like, yeah, your mom maybe, you know, has a devil in her with dark, whatever you want to call it, right? She's got it in there. What a gift that it makes you aware of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the choices you yeah. make become different. Mm -hmm. There's yes. all these gifts in it. Now, that's second to six. Yeah. So your work is right. to go back through, fuck that, I'm hit, whatever, yeah. right? And work yeah. it up through. But this idea of safe and unsafe parents, as parents, we will fuck up our kids. Mm -hmm. We'll probably fuck up our dogs and cats. <laughs> but it is. We <laughs> will. My dog takes on everything. I like come home from something emotional. And she <coughs> look at me like a cutter, and then she's like, oh, holy. <laughs> she will literally graze for 30 minutes on grass. <laughs> when I'm sick, my girls get more lethargic. It's almost like they're taking yeah. it from me. They do. Yeah, I know, I know they do. They do. Yeah. Uh, and I thank them. Right. Mm -hmm. So it becomes this place. So animals are a little different, right? Animals have spiritual contracts. Most animals, unless they're traumatized, animals come in as healers or teachers. Oh, they want to oh heal, God. they want to absorb, or they want to teach you. That's why they're here. Wow. It was no coincidence that the basset hound I had as my graduation gift from my parents, that my grandmother said, you have to buy that baby a dog. Um, but the basset hound that they had when my mom had breast cancer, I went to like my first ever uh, energy healing chakra diet. I didn't even know what it was. Mm -hmm. And she, I remember her saying, I need to, I need you to recognize the energy of cancer. And I was like, I think she's speaking a different language. And she explained it to me. She was like, it's, it looks black. It like, she mm. kind of told me how it feels. And I'm like, okay. Didn't think about it. Two years after my mom was healed, my dog died of a rare form of breast cancer. <gasps> and I was like, I killed my dog. <laughs> but, but I knew she had absorbed that because I was absorbing it from my mom, but she absorbed that from me, so I didn't have any of those effects. Wow. And that was her gift to me after nine years. Oh. And so it's like that's, that's kind of the beauty of animals. Children will absorb your stuff, but you shouldn't let them. Right? It's, it's not their responsibility to absorb your shit. It's your responsibility to take care of it. But now... In that divine space, we're always going to fuck our children up because they, in that space that they're in, of like, ooh, I need this DNA, this male DNA, this female DNA, I need this set of issues, I need, ooh, these, I can get these characteristics, ooh, these are the perfect parents for me. And then there's a bunch of souls mm -hmm. vying for bodies that stand around mom, and mom's trying to negotiate, like, ooh, this soul, this soul, right? So when they come in, their spirit's already aware. They consciously chose yeah. based on whatever issues they need to have 
from whatever spiritual healings they need to do. That's crazy. She looked at me one time and said, Mom, I chose you. No, she did. <laughs> I, was, I was like, and this was after yes. multiple <laughs> energy workers have said that her and I go way back. We kept flip flopping. Oh, right. Like she was my mom, I was her mom, like many, many lifetimes times ago. Oh, and like two days later, she was just like, No, Mom, I, ch I, I chose you. Right. And I was like, yeah. Oh my god. She did. I almost like wow. fell over. So it's like that. I was trying to play it cool, like, oh, that's nice. But <laughs> <laughs> like, the, the only thing you can do, right? Yeah. Like, when you're when you're wow. like, oh my god, am I fucking your right. person? You know, beat your children yes. or your partners or whatever. <clears throat> what you can do is your responsibility and owning your actions and not avoiding. Owning it, oof, I messed that up, ooh, I'm so sorry. Ooh, I would never do this again. Oh, do you remember that time when this happened? I wish I hadn't done that. That's how you stay on the up and up because you're demonstrating that responsibility and that awareness and showing up. And the second best thing you can do is to allow your child to have emotions, not talk him or her out of it. Mm. We so often want to talk someone out of what they're feeling, right? Oh, we're moving. Oh, I'll lose all my friends. But it's going to be great. Right. You're going to have, yeah, fuck that. Don't say that. Mm -hmm. I know it's so sad. Mm -hmm. It must be. So, yeah. yeah. Well, they were like, exactly. in, growing up, it was like good emotions or bad emotions. Yep. Right. It was like we bury yes. all of these and we just focus on. Yes. Them. Keep going. Yes. We don't yes. talk about yeah. that. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> we don't like it was. Yeah. No, we don't. We want to honor the gamut of it. Yeah. 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 Because your kids are going to come out with issues because they also have spiritual healing. Yeah. And if we strive to, you know, let me be the perfect parent and let me, a, there's no such thing. And B, you're probably gonna have more fucked up kids. Right. Because they need to be fucked up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> right? Right. right? They need it. I, yeah. I was in a relationship and the child, um, I think we had gotten mad at each other, like me and my partner. And the child just like shut down. We were like, what's happening? So we took to his therapist, because of course I'm like, I'm not dating you unless kids in therapy every week. So, <laughs> I'm so high demand. <laughs> so we, she does so the therapist, and the therapist was like, he's having trouble recognizing that you can argue and still love each other because mm -hmm. he's never seen you argue. And we're like, well, we just really don't do it that way. And she's like, so I need you to start fake fighting. And we had to start fake arguing and getting angry. And I remember like being road raged for a little bit. Like, I'll show him road rage. We'll do it. That was kind of fun. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your body would like get amped up because your body doesn't know what your brain, that would be, right? well, that'd be stressful. Yeah. Like, right. Drain you. So we had to like yeah. fake it so that he, we could teach him like, mm -hmm. you can actually have a fight and still love each other. Mm -hmm. It can work. Mm -hmm. Kids need. They need some of that. They need some of those stressful places. They have to learn resilience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Any other questions? Because I know I must be getting to time. I have a comment. I feel the lightest I've ever felt my whole entire life right now. Yay! Like, uh, I'm just like, I feel like a hot air balloon. Oh, thank you. That's beautiful.